Hello, this is Telecom TV. I am talking with Azhar Saeed, who is Chief Technologist at Red Hat. Azhar, great to see you. Thank you, Martin. How are you doing? I'm very well. We're in London. You're in Boston in Massachusetts. So a little delay on the line, but that's fine. Here we go. At Red Hat, you have a development model for building open source solutions from the work of open source communities. So, can you tell us how this philosophy translated into the virtual central office project that built the VCO 5G cloud native demo as was seen at KubeCom in North America? Sure. Uh, Martin, actually what happened was we started this project way back about two years ago um, as part of the OPNFE community. Um, and the original goal was to create a blueprint uh, for central office uh, with as many open source components as possible. And, uh, uh, you know, so we initially held a workshop. It was a proposal we submitted with OPNF. We held a workshop at the Open Daylight Summit way, way back in Seattle around three years ago. And then uh, started getting some discussions going with the help of OPNFE community, uh, particularly Heather and Brandon, um, to, you know, gauge interest among different sets of providers uh, to see whether they would be interested in doing something like this. So we found immediately some you know uh, well wishers i would say or some supporters from the telco community they came back and said yeah we're really interested in building a, a blueprint with as many open source components as possible uh, for residential services for business services and for mobile services so that's how we kicked off a project in opnfe for vco and once we did that uh, then we started to actually do the due diligence and exercise to figure out what open source components are available and what can we use. And as you would see from the progression we have made in 1.0, 2.0, and then now with the 5G um, uh, demo, um, uh, we found some network functions. It originally, when we were doing the virtualized environment, um, so we found some network functions that were available as open source. We used them. Uh, of course, we were using open source platforms um, the, like the Red Hat OpenStack and, uh, you know, um, Red Hat OpenShift. Uh, but we were also using actually some of the network functions that were available as open source, like the PFSense firewall, the uh, YOS router, um, uh, and so on. In the, at least in the first two demos, we did that. Um, then when we came down to the third one, especially the 5G one, uh, we started asking the same set of questions again to the community to say, hey, uh, what is available? Uh, while the platforms in the Linux operating system and the Kubernetes tools and all of those things were available as open source, obviously some of the network functions uh, were not available as open source. Uh, we did use some open source network functions here as in this one as well, particularly the Clearwater IMS from Metaswitch um, and some rerouting functions. Uh, but uh, most of the other network functions were commercials, and that also allowed, obviously, uh, our partners who, who you know, provide these network functions uh, to be part of the uh, infrastructure. So that's kind of how it went. It came about in terms of, you know, incorporating as many open source components as possible and then building um, an infrastructure that allows people to showcase their capabilities to build a completely open platform. Um, for mobile services and for residential and business services. Okay, great. Can you tell us then how you managed to build momentum behind such an ambitious project? Were, were partners and the ecosystem at first somewhat skeptical or were they all happy to join in straight away? Yeah, I think that took us a little bit of time. Uh, to be honest, uh, sometimes in, in one of those uh, demos, it was a exercise of more than, you know, um, six, seven months in another. It was more an exercise of more than about eight months, I would say. Um, but I think after the first two were done, the third one was a little bit easier um, because People already saw the track record in terms of how we were able to showcase certain capabilities um, as part of the ONS summits, particularly. First, the OPNFV summit in Beijing and then the ONS summit in Amsterdam last year. And once you have a track record of you know, what you can show, uh, then people will certainly come around. Uh, but actually, just let me back up a little bit for a moment. Um, it was more about 
showing and articulating value uh, to uh, two of the partners in terms of what do they get out of it, right? I mean, first of all, what's the novelty? I mean, what are we doing? What's the innovation? What's the novelty in this project? Um, and what do the partners get out of this particular conversation? So uh, let me start off first by the VCO 2.0 when we did the split run architecture uh, and the split run demo. As soon as we did that demo in ONS in Amsterdam, everybody started talking about, hey, um, here's how you can do a split run architecture on an open source platform uh, with those VNFs that are available. Um, and it was still a virtualized platform. It was not cloud native. Um, and now we started talking about that capability to all of our customers. Every single partner did. Um, Heather, when she went out to every single you know, a meeting that they have around the world um, on LF networking, she started talking about, you know, here's an opportunity. So people see that as value in terms of how they can uh, provide their capabilities, showcase their presence in terms of the partners. Um, and then when it comes to the last one, particularly the cloud native 5G one, um, it was a no-brainer in, in, in some ways. Why? Because one, KubeCon, the biggest stage, uh, 5G, the hottest topic, and cloud native, the hottest topic. So you literally had the trifecta <laughs> you know, coming together. And so it was literally very easy for people to, to, to convince people and say, hey, uh, we are trying to showcase this, I think. Uh, and we had actually lots of people interested in making it happen, and it did happen, so. Great stuff, Azza, thank you. Now, Red Hat works closely with several open source communities, including the open air interface or radio access networks and other network elements. In some ways, this perhaps is the final frontier, as it were, of software development necessary for 5G. Given that, could you explain your work in this area and also about the evolution towards 5G core cloud network architectures? Okay, sure. Um, you know, most of the applications that are being developed today are developed to a microservices architecture model, uh, particularly true in the IT space. Uh, now, as we start to build 5G infrastructure, uh, the 5G architecture lends itself very well to incorporating a microservices model. And so the network functions can be are, you know, disaggregated to leverage those common you know, catalog of functions that are available uh, so that you can build an efficient cloud native infrastructure and cloud native model. With that in mind, um, what when we started to do the exercise for VCO, uh, specifically the, the latest one on the, on the cloud native 5G, um, we went around asking to see if there were actually open source cloud native core, 5G core that was available. Um, we found, uh, and then we ended up partnering with Open Air Interface. We had already worked with them before on the split ran on the 2.0, and Open Air Interface came back and said, well, while we don't have a 5G core yet, but we are working towards containerizing our current LTE core, and we'll use that same platform to develop the 5G core. So we said, okay, let's start. And so we actually started working with them and ensuring that they have the platform with the capabilities that they need to develop this particular 5G core and to develop the containerization of the LTE core. Uh, so this work actually started almost a year ago before the demo. Uh, we s did the setup with them, we, we enabled their infrastructure, and then we worked with them on a regular basis to actually go to develop. In the meantime, we also found one of our partners in Altran who actually had a 5G core. So we said, okay, you have a commercial 5G core that you have developed, why don't we take that and onboard it? as part of uh, uh, this particular demo. And so that's what we ended up doing. So that's why you literally see two different packet cores uh, on two different you know, locations um, that were instantiated right on top of that infrastructure to actually get this demo together. Now, um, from what was Red Hat's motivation? Red Hat's motivation primarily was to ensure that the infrastructure can tackle some of the requirements for radio access network, for the 5G core, in terms of, you know, there are some new enhancements and, and things that are needed to make these applications run properly. Um, things such as, if you're, particularly if you're running radio infrastructure, um, how you need real-time capabilities. 
you need you know some level of delivery guarantee on the infrastructure right uh, you need to handle things in a low latency uh, with with very low latency um, you need some amount of throughput because you're really trying to now build a 5g infrastructure that's all about much higher bandwidth per user so these are some things that we and th and then there are some protocol specific things like sctp support like um, you know uh, ipv6 requirements and so on and so forth so these are certain things that we were interested in actually enabling as part of the platform, making it available to people so that they can onboard their VNFs and test it. So that was our, our prime motivation, to ensure that the platform is ready for commercial deployment. And this was a fantastic exercise for us to go experiment, work with a community of people, with a community of partners to see, does it really work? Right? And so that's exactly how we ended up doing it. That's how we, we moved the ball forward. And we learned a lot through this exercise, um, not just us, but all of our partners as well, and even the providers. So certainly open air interface is one community that we've been working with very closely to develop these capabilities. The other one's ORAN. Um, and then there are a couple of other uh, commercial, uh, you know, or, or loose partnership with, with, with different uh, vendors and, and providers around uh, Open RAN Alliance and, and so on and so forth. But ORAN is another area where we've been participating very closely, particularly, again, to understand those infrastructure requirements that I was talking to you about. Great. Thank you. Moving on, a more general question in some ways. What advice do you have for network operators and vendors looking to support geographically dispersed networks to dynamically configure their network services and start migrating some workloads into things like Kubernetes clusters in the cloud? Um, several important things. Uh, first and foremost, make sure that when you do the migration of those workloads into cloud native environment, those workloads are appropriately suited for cloud native environment. Uh, don't make the same mistakes that people made when they virtualized their applications first. So what did they do when during virtualization? They took the application that was running on a dedicated piece of hardware, the network function especially, just put a wrapper around it, and said, here's a virtualized application, a virtualized network function, and then faced a lot of problems because it was not done properly. Uh, the same uh, attempt or, or the same temptation is in front of them again as they containerize um, and, and build those network functions again. So do it right this time. So that will allow them to really utilize the cloud infrastructure better and cloud resources better. Now, when you disaggregate those applications right, then you can really truly operate on the basis of cloud principles. Uh, so, which means you can take the application, disaggregate it right, and make as many stateless components as possible. Once you make them stateless, then you can apply cloud native principles of restartability, scalability, um, you know, very, very well. When, when you do that, then you can actually go deploy them in a geographically dispersed manner. Because from a cloud perspective, if it is a stateless application or stateless microservice, then it can be deployed pretty much anywhere. As long as the APIs are consistent and they utilize the principles of cloud, then you're not you know, creating a stateful system, which means now you can actually pr pretty much deploy it in public cloud, in private cloud, in a hybrid cloud type of an environment. So when you're building those 5G cores, particularly those vendors who have a stake in this area of, you know, um, providing those network functions, then they really need to take charge here and build them right so that you can utilize the cloud principles. Second, um, you have to worry about how the network infrastructure is built, particularly when you're talking about geographically distributed uh, capabilities. Um, so you need to think about how do you deploy this in a multi-cluster environment? Um, in 5G specifically, for example, you will have UPF, uh, the, the user plane function, that's probably sitting in a different location than the control plane. Um, and that is a geographically dispersed environment as, as your question, Martin. And so you will have to make sure that the networking and the SDN, the software defined network environment is done right. And you have the multi-cluster capabilities that are now coming in Kubernetes as well. Um, to be able to manage these independent clusters and put them 
in a federated way that allows you to manage that as a single cluster overall. Um, place applications, place functions, place capabilities where they are needed in a dynamic manner. And then the last part I would say is automation will absolutely be the key. Automation through something like Ansible or even something like operator framework. Um, operator framework operators are something really useful in terms of codifying operations knowledge um, that can be then utilized as a Kubernetes object to be able to act upon them um, in an automated fashion. So that is a really powerful phenomena. And these three things, in my opinion, will be really key in terms of deploying in a geographical distributed manner at 5G infrastructure. Great answer. I'm going to ask you to put your uh, crystal ball in front of you and look into it now. That's uh -oh. how you wouldn't mind. Um, look, the telecoms industry has, has changed immensely over the past decade. So here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. Where do you think the industry will be in 10 years' time? And how will it get there? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Martin. It's kind of hard to predict uh, using a crystal ball because the pace of change has changed. Uh, you know, the pace of change is much more rapid now uh, versus what it was a decade ago. Um, you know, in 2012 was when we, we first published the NFV white paper and we were talking about virtualization at that time. In six years time, seven years time, now we're talking about, you know, cloud native uh, infrastructure. So, we not only did did architect the virtualized infrastructure, but we deployed it, we saw the benefits of it, and then we said, okay, let's take the next step. So literally in the last three years, I think things have changed much more rapidly than, than the previous five, and uh, and then uh, which was much more rapid than the previous decade before that. So in 10 years time, in my personal opinion, it will um, move at a much faster pace. I think a lot of applications would be disaggregated, leveraging the cloud native principles. Um, a lot of uh, you know automation, in my opinion, will be done um, for this infrastructure. Because, and then the third element in 10 years time, in my opinion, would be um, uh, particularly applying principles like artificial intelligence to uh, really make this infrastructure much more dynamic and much more autonomous. Um, I think there's a lot of conversation these days around autonomous infrastructure, autonomous networking, um, you know, autonomous load management. And this is all being done through telemetry, orchestration, and automation of that through intelligence, through learning machine intelligence. And so in my opinion, 10 years time, I think you'll see many more services uh, that are much uh, faster to be delivered, uh, many more capabilities, and uh, infrastructure that almost you know borderlines on operating itself. Um, I think uh, certainly that's uh, feasible. Certainly that's possible. And with the pace of change that's happening now, I think uh, it's within that within the realm. Excellent interview. As I said, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. It was my pleasure.